Hiya, I'm Jasper, and welcome to a video review for Star Trek Enterprise Season 3. So, as always, I'm going to give you the good, the bad, and the furry. To start off the furry, still got his beagle in there, and then there's various other animals and anthropomorphic type things in a Star Trek show. So, moving on to the good and the bad. Ah, the Zindi. I actually really liked the Zindi storyline overall. Um, I didn't like how much of the, like, 29th century Cold War, 31st century, whatever thing, like, interfered with it. And yes, it was the genesis for it, but it was better than the overall just Cold War thing of it. Like, I liked that the focus was about the Zindi and trying to stop them, more so than the, like, time travel aspect of it. Um, I also liked that they did a good job of establishing that, like, yes, there's the insectoids, the primates, the reptilians, and, like, vastly different looking things, but Phlox is like, they actually have so similar DNA that it's, that these people are closer to each other in terms of percentage of shared DNA than humans are with monkeys. And I thought that was a fun way to do it. But yeah, I also thought that it was interesting that at the end of season two or whatever, it's just like, we're going to go get them from wherever they are. And then in this one, they're like, yeah, we've been Traveling for six weeks and haven't found anything. Like, it just it was kind of a slow start. I was like, oh, I, I, yeah, I guess it is. You just got to keep on searching and searching and searching. And, um, yeah, so that was, uh, that was interesting. Uh, the next episode was Anomaly. And I kind of forgot that we got to see the spheres so soon into the season. I thought that they spent a while searching for them and mapping them and figuring them out. And, uh, nope, they get to a sphere in, in episode two. So I was like, oh. Well, that's neat that they got to there so soon and that they got so much of the database so soon. So that was fun. Uh, the next episode, Extinction. Once again, once again, Starfleet. Wear your environmental suits, you idiots. This whole episode of them turning into native land people, whatever, is just so dumb. Because if you had dumb motherfuckers had just worn your vac suits, wouldn't have had this issue. Anywho. Uh, moving on to Red Jean. So, anyone who has watched Firefly and seen the Our Mrs. Reynolds episode, you'll be like, huh, I know exactly what's going to happen with her in this episode the minute you see her, and you will not be wrong. So, moving on. They did it better in Firefly, but this wasn't bad. Uh, Impulse. So, I thought that the whole Trellium D causing problems with Vulcans type of thing... I thought that that was a really fun, smart way to keep them isolated. Because in season one and two, basically any time they were in trouble, the Vulcans could just swoop in with their more powerful and faster ships to come and save the day. And it's just like, it's like the Enterprise was their little brother, and then they're going to call on their big brother whenever something happens that they need help with. So I like that they came up with this thing of basically the Vulcans can't get into the Expanse because the only way to be safe in the Expanse is by using a thing that makes them go all crazy. I thought that was genius. Uh, next is Exile, where the dude who has mind control powers is able to read Hoshi's mind and get her... It's a Hoshi-centric episode, which means I don't really care about it. But also, this dude was just, like, Star Trek version of an incel. Like, she's never gonna stay with you, man. She's just never gonna do it. I don't know. There's no reason for her to. Uh, this also seemed like a worse version of the, uh, I don't know, like, sex candle from... Star Trek The Next Generation, or the Nebula chick from Star Trek Voyager with Tuvok. I just, this one seems like the worst of all of that type of episode out of the Star Trek universe. The next episode, The Shipment, is, you know, I think that this one was actually one that made sense of Star Trek being like, hey, just because this species might be the enemy, or the government might be the en enemy, doesn't mean every person of the species is evil and bad. So, I like that. I mean, in this particular time, I think that it works for that message. And that message makes sense during this time period. The next episode was Twilight. Oh, man. I think it's the final bit of T'Pol Captain Archer romance thing. Um, which they had, you know, in the fake future. Which, by the way, the NX, the NX-01 still operating, like, what, 12, 20, 30, whatever years in the future, especially after... Like, how easily it's damaged and how much time they would have to spend at Jupiter Station in order to get repaired. Like, unless they keep on visiting that thing that keeps on stealing people for the mind uh, to operate and just wanting a couple of gallons of warp plasma. Like, 
I don't know how it would still be operational, but sure, whatever. I feel like this episode was because there was probably a split in the fandom, at least I assume there was, of a bunch of people who really liked the Captain and DePaul and a bunch of people who really didn't and were kind of leaning and maybe a third tier who wanted uh, DePaul and Trip. But I feel like this was the send-off episode of like, hey, everybody who liked DePaul and Captain Archer romance, here's your episode of where what could have been. And then never address it again, especially because within a couple episodes, they're, they're progressing the T'Pol and Trip storyline, which I felt had much more uh, plausibility. It was a lot more natural. They had a, much, a lot more chemistry. And it just, it was much less tacky than the captain macking on his first officer. Like, bro, come on. Um, <laughs> so, after that uh, was North Star, where, you know, once again, you get the Star Trek-ism of, hey, hey guys, remember... Racism is bad, and also Westerns are fun. Because, you know, you got the Skagarans in this version of it. But yeah, uh, racism is bad, and Westerns are fun is basically Star Trek's message with that episode. Uh, next is Similitude. So they introduce a clone tech to be able to clone Trip, and then never see that technology or creature or whatever ever again in any Star Trek instance whatsoever. It seems like it would have been useful in a couple of different time periods, like... Maybe that one time where, uh, you know, in Deep Space Nine, where um, Shakar got his brain all damaged. If only they'd had one of these things, they might have been able to fix him. Anywho, uh, so, you know, you never see that again. And, uh, yeah, I, I feel like this whole episode was just for the last 30 seconds or, or so, whatever that time period was, uh, where Clone Trip admits to T'Pol that he has feelings for her. And I really liked that they kissed. That was awesome. Uh, next was Carpenter Street. It has the dude from the movie Seven, and he's been in a bunch of other things, but that's kind of where I most remember him from. But he was also in a number of other shows and movies and whatnot during this time period, so it's cool to see him in something. Uh, I think it's funny that DePaul was so judgmental about the fact that he was uh, picking up these people and delivering them who he was told would not be killed, uh, for $5,000 a piece. And she's like, you did all this for $5,000? Bitch, please, you have no idea, no idea what the inflation rate is or what the currency value is in this time period. Because this was set in, what, 95, 2001, whatever time period around there. And yeah, we know that $5,000 was, a, like, a lot of money for a low-income person, but not, not, like, winning the Powerball lottery. But, but... You rewind the clock to 1920s or, you know, a little bit earlier than that, just when the automobile was starting to come out. You know, like, take Oklahoma, for example. The movie Oklahoma, or, well, I'm sorry, the play Oklahoma, whatever, I saw the movie of it. Um, <laughs> so, in that, one of the main characters is, like, desperate to marry this one chick, and in order to marry this one chick, her dad is like, you gotta give me $50 cash, like, to show that, you know, you're wealthy and that you have enough money and yada, yada, yada. And so... He gets $50 cash from winning this big-ass, like, multi-county tournament -y thing, I think. And so he's got $50 cash. And that is a huge amount and just, like, a phenomenal amount. And to put that in perspective, they had this, like, auction thing to help fund his schoolhouse. And nobody had ever even bid over $10 for anything. And, and this dude has $50. So imagine if $50 was enough to buy a person. Um... <laughs> In this con, in the Star Trek context of like, fifty dollars was a was a lot of money, <laughs> and then he's doing this for five thousand dollars. Like, that's another couple zeros on there, friend. Would you pick up some random people and deliver them to some other random people that said that they were not going to kill them if they were going to give you fifty million dollars, five hundred million dollars? Five billion dollars a person? Like, what's your what's your limit? I just I feel like she was being extra judgy. So yeah. Um, but moving on from there to uh, <laughs> you got the chosen realm. So chosen realm had uh, I guess they had to mer nerf the map that they had somehow because they had too much information on how the spheres were working and they were gonna solve the problem too soon. So they had to figure out a way to nerf that to get the rest of the season going. So yeah, introduce Zealous that uh, delete their database. Sure, why not? And then next is Proving Ground. I love any excuse to get me more of Shran. So got Commander Shran in there. 
And I feel like they came up with a good enough reason to have them team up, which is to stop that weapons test. After that was Stratagem. And I feel like I've seen the, like, the Degra memory thing before, where they convince him that he's been locked up and he's with this person and it's like, it's erased his memory. And so we got to do the thing to try and get out the information that they actually want from him. I feel like I've seen that in other movies or other TV shows, but like none of them are coming to mind. So I don't know where I've seen that. And maybe I'm just remembering all the times I've seen this episode because it's a pretty memorable episode. But in my mind, I don't... I feel like I've seen it before, but I don't know where. So if you know of an episode that was similar to that, or a, t or a movie, let me know in the comments down below. Uh, after that was Harbinger, and so I like that we finally get info on why the spheres are there. I do feel like the sphere builder multidimensional aliens were a bit too similar to the Sulabon. Uh, I feel like they had the same color scheme, and especially in that era when the TVs were smaller... I feel like they would have looked too similar to Sulevan and that they should have at least had a different color for the skin or something. Like, yeah, they didn't have the pebbly skin, but it was just too similar, I think, to the Sulevan that a casual viewer might think that it was just, like, one of the Sulevan and think that, okay, now the Sulevans are the bad guys again, which is not what they were doing. Uh, next was Doctor's Orders. I love me a good Flocks episode. Uh, I found, you know, the... <laughs> It's fun to have, like, the guy who's not in charge of things to be in charge of the ship and, like, fixing all the things. I do feel like they had to stretch a little bit to have him panic so much and not know so many of the things about the thing, uh, ship. Because he has, like, what, 21 different doctorates for things, and none of them at all had any sort of, like, engineering subcourse minors. I feel like he probably knew some things. So I'm going to just chalk it up to the nebula, making him hallucinate and forget some of his training to have that level of panic. And I do really appreciate the uh, the reveal at the very end of it, where it's just like, ah, T'Pol was a hallucination the whole time, too. I was like, that's kind of fun. That's good. That makes sense. I like that. And then it's fun to rewatch that episode, knowing that, if you hadn't already figured it out. Um, and then after that was Hatchery, which, Doc, you went from an excellent win of saving the whole crew with your special mind abilities to fucking up scanning the captain after he's been sprayed with some shit. You or why this episode happened in the first place, because you fucked up. If you just scanned him properly, then you would have noticed that shit was wrong with him. And it took way too long for the rest of the crew to figure out that there was something wrong with him and be willing to do something about it. There are so many other episodes of so many other Star Trek shows, and even this one, where, like, a person who is in charge of things starts acting wrong, and people do something about it so much sooner. Um, but we're gonna crop, you know... Toss this up to like, oh, this is early Star Trek days where they have it just, or early Starfleet days where they have it established procedures for, you know, proper mutiny, but even though they started a bunch of regulations for this. Moving on! Um, so, Azadi Prime. I am so tired of Deus Ex Daniel. So tired of him saying, Archer, you're important. Don't sacrifice yourself. Archer, you're going to be doing all these things. Archer, you're, you're the cause of blah, blah, blah. Like, you're just making it so that anytime he's in danger, we know he's not going to be in danger. Just fuck off already, Daniels. <sighs> Next was damage. Um, yay for more Damar, or Casey Biggs, technically speaking. But I like him. I like that he got another part. I like that he's in this show. Uh, I think it's fucked up that the captain stranded him for three years. I feel like none of the other captains would have made that choice. I also think that, like... Sure, the initial strand was really douchey to begin with, but you could argue that he's going to go solve this Zindi problem and then come back in less than three years, because it's just an immediate thing that he has to solve, and he does it within a few days, a week, a few weeks, whatever. You should then be able to go find these people that you stranded on a three-year journey. They are at impulse, bro. They are not going anywhere fast. And you know what? They never, ever come back for them. Not in this season, and as far as I can remember, not in season four either. They just strand these motherfuckers and are just like, sucks to suck, bro, never giving you your coil back, or sending anybody to give you one. So, I think that is probably the biggest mess up <laughs> uh, that they did in this show. Anyhow, uh, next was The Forgotten. Eh. I mean, I guess that they needed to have an episode to show them how they convinced the Zindi for things, but it's an otherwise forgettable episode. Um, and then next was E-squared. It's... 
<sighs> it's so dumb. I feel like they had a throwaway line at the beginning of the season where they're like, oh, what about that rumor of a second ship? That hasn't been proven. And they're like, shit, we set that up. Now we have to do something about it. It just, it was, it was dumb. Because... It was already a little hard to believe that Voyager's crew, who was on a journey home for 70,000 light years on a, on a ship, an intrepid class size, would be able to make it a generational ship. They had holodecks and, like, way more cargo and bigger living quarters and all that jazz. Like, that's already hard to believe. But you want to tell me that for 75 fucking years, or however long it was, that they're going to make the NX-01 a generational ship? Like... Go fuck yourself. This was just such a bullshit episode that I just, I did not care for it at all. It was not believable whatsoever. It was dumb, and it introduced even dumber time paradoxes than the co temporal Cold War has, so skip. Next was the Council, and I feel like they inserted the last episode of E Squared in order to just break up, like, the forgotten of them trying to convince him. And then this one, where they're still doing convincing and, and that sort of thing. Like, it's just, it's neat that they had this continuous storyline for the last, like, five, six episodes or so. Like, that it was just one big, long episode without, like, side diversions for, you know, go find this, go find that, whatever. It's neat. But I also feel like that this was just a little bit of a continuation that they wanted to break it up by inserting that other bullshit. Uh, and then next was Countdown and, you know... Once again, they had to find a reason to make Hoshi be useful, and I actually kind of liked it. I was like, okay, cool, she's actually going to be useful, and oh, look at that, she's actually being strong in this by resisting all the torture, so good for her. Uh, so it's one of the few Hoshi episodes that I'm not, like, I'm fine with, it's fine. I'm not a, I don't, I don't dislike it. And then, lastly, was Zero Hour. So it was really neat to see the Sphere's destruction, uh, and how it led to all the other Sphere's destruction. I also liked... In the last episode, last couple of episodes where they had the big CGI battles, especially with the aquatic ship, I like that they did a really good sound and phaser design because it didn't matter how chaotic the battles were getting, you could always identify what ship. So you had Shran's ship and that had a distinct like shape to it and the, the phaser coming out of it was distinct and the aquatics, they had that size difference and that overall shape difference and how their weapons worked and so... You know, the reptilians and the, like, every single species had a very different style of ship and had a very different style of phaser, and they had a, a good way to delineate all that, and so it made the battles pretty exciting. Also, when that aquatic ship broke up, first of all, I felt really bad, but second of all, that was really cool looking. Um, and then just when the sphere builders were like, shit, we gotta try and save our spheres, just just hit the spatial distortion button to bring out our s fluid space. That was kind of neat to see how it just like super messed up ships as soon as it came in contact with it. Um, the sphere's destruction in general was cool and I liked that that trail. And you know, the destruction of the uh, the other like attack uh, weapon was also neat. The one thing that I will say is especially for somebody who has seen so many movies with Tom Cruise running, that I don't know if he just had poor direction, if he fucked up the take that was supposed to run, if he'd run a whole bunch of times and the shit had just not worked out until he had to slow down to jog, or if because of how the explosions were going, they needed him to jog, or if because they thought that the explosions were going to be a different way, they told him that they needed him to jog in order to make the explosion look cool, but whatever happened, somebody somewhere fucked up. Because his running on that catwalk from the explosion was just the, like, I'm just out on a Sunday morning jog. It had no energy to it whatsoever. There was it completely ruined whatever danger they were trying to show. Just he was just like, yep, out for a Sunday jog as the shit's like blowing up around him. He should have just been hauling ass, and he did not look like he was, regardless of if he was or not. The slow mo guy, the camera thing, or the people who thought that it would look cool, or somebody somewhere made the wrong choice because that was the wrong choice. Um, but anywho. I definitely liked this season overall. I thought there was a lot of good character development. I liked the Paul trip thing and the, like, bullshit excuse to get them in their underwear to get that, like, touchy-touchy thing with the uh, Vulcan neuropressure, which is just glorified massage, man. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a fun time. I, I enjoyed it, and I think it was probably my favorite season uh, because it had that Deep Space Nine-esque, like, yeah, there was little side things for each instance, but the overall arching mission of taking out the Zindi. 
The only problem is, you know, it still had the uh, temporal cold war bullshit. But other than that, fun time. So recommend, go check it out. That's all I have for this one. Thanks for coming. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you at the next one. Bye.